chemical engineer in practice is going to have to be able to figure out what kind of temperature to expect an effluent stream of a reactor to have based on thermodynamic properties. And so what I'm going to do in this video is walk through an example problem in which we have an inlet feed to some kind of endothermic reactor and there's going to be a reaction. The species, the identity of the species present and the concentrations of these species will change inside of our reactor and we're going to have a new effluent stream that has a new composition and a different temperature. And so the goal will be to be able to figure out what kind of temperature this effluent stream will have. Um, and this is important because we need to know this information to size heat exchangers, for instance, for our downstream processes from our reactor. And so if we were dealing with an endothermic reaction in practice, um, we would typically be supplying heat to it to shift equilibrium towards our products. So I will just write that in here that we have some kind of heat flow rate, big Q dot entering our endothermic reactor. And the thing is, we're now working with not single component or binary component systems. We might be looking at uh, streams that have no numerous components. And so now instead of looking at an individual liquid, for instance, mole ratio, uh, we're now looking at a vector and the vector will contain the mole ratio of all components that exist inside of your feed stream, for instance. And so the goal is, uh, if we're going to, in this example, I'm going to be assuming we're working entirely in liquids um, and we do use a different set of equations for vapors, but if we're working entirely with liquids and we want to determine what is the enthalpy of component I in a liquid stream, we do that by following this relationship here. And so um, this is the variable that we're interested in defining as a function of temperature, the enthalpy of component I in that liquid. And what we do is we first look up the tabulated value of the uh, standard enthalpy of formation of component I. And this is a constant value as well. So this is something you would just look up in a book. Um, and then we take into account the um, impact that the change in temperature uh, will have on uh, our species I as a result of uh, the reaction, for instance. And so this is where we take into account the specific heat dependence on temperature. And sometimes it, this is a small enough figure that we can neglect it and that makes our life uh, easier, but that's not always the case. And so that's the reason why we have to include these terms in. And then finally, uh, we are going to be subtracting the enthalpy of vaporization of component I at that temperature T. And so this is what makes our life uh, a bit more difficult. Um, and so this is the enthalpy of vaporization at temperature T. And so to get this term, we're going to turn to something referred to as the Watson correlation. And what the Watson correlation tells us is that we can uh, determine the enthalpy of vaporization of component I as a function of temperature by uh, first finding what the enthalpy of vaporization of component I is at the atmospheric boiling point TB. I hope we can read my handwriting. Um, and we multiply this. And so let me just make this also, this is also a tabulated constant value because um, if we hold pressure constant, um, we know enthalpy is a function of temperature and pressure. Uh, therefore, uh, this atmospheric boiling point or the enthalpy of vaporization at the atmospheric pressure will be a constant value for this species I. And this is, again, stuff we just look up in a book. Um, and then we're going to multiply this quantity by something referred to as the critical temperature of species I minus whatever temperature we're interested in determining the enthalpy of vaporization of component I. We're dividing this quantity again by 
uh, TCI minus, and then the atmospheric boiling point of uh, component I. And then we're going to raise this to the power eta. And typically, eta is equal to 0 0.38, but sometimes it's slightly different. But if you don't know, you're going to go with an eta value equivalent to 0 0.38. And so to talk a bit more about what this TCI value is, it is referred to as the critical boiling point. And what that means is, depending on what your pressure is, um, this will be uh, the temperature at which I begins to bubble. So as we know with water, for instance, if you hold the temperature constant but decrease the pressure what you'll find is that the water begins to boil as if you decrease the pressure enough and so this just goes to illustrate how the critical temperature can will decrease as we decrease the pressure um, and so this is something that again is going to be uh, a tabulated value that we can look up so uh, just to spell it out, TCI is a function of pressure. And um, so with these values, we can then determine what the enthalpy of vaporization of component I is at any given temperature. And then with this term, we can fully define what our enthalpy of component I is in the liquid phase of our mixture. And finally, what we can do uh, after you've done this for all your components K, and again, it's, it's, this is mostly uh, algebra and looking up tabulated values, which is stuff that computers are excellent at doing, um, such as you'll use a program such as Aspen, um, but you may have to do this by hand on a thermodynamics exam. Um, but once you've done this for all components present in these streams, uh, and a, a side note here is you would need to know the effluent composition as well as the feed composition uh, to do this because if you don't know the identity of your components, um, then you won't be able to look up many of the tabulated values you're going to need for this. Um, but if we carry on with this calculation, um, because we would generally know a priori what the reactor is going to be doing, we know what our products are or what kind of composition to expect. With that information, now we would determine the total uh, mixture's enthalpy of formation by following the following reaction or equation. And that tells us that delta H, and I'll call this big L, which is a function of the temperature as well as the composition vector of all your components um, present, is equivalent to the sum of I gets from one to K, where K is the number of components that we have. We're gonna multiply this by the liquid mole ratio of component I present in the liquid. And then we're gonna multiply this quantity by the standard enthalpy of formation of component I. And then we're going to also add in the integral that takes into account how the specific heat capacity of component I evolves with temperature. And you'll also make a note how we're changing slightly the variable name we're using here. Um, in the textbooks, you'll find that uh, they shift variables sometimes like tau. And you shouldn't worry about this. This is just so that we don't get confused with um, these other terms that we have here. So um, because we're also taking into account now the vapor, the, the enthalpy of vaporization's dependence of component I on temperature. And um, this will let us uh, fully realize what uh, the total mixture's liquid enthalpy will be. And another thing that I would like to make a note of, because I know in thermodynamics, uh, this is a problem that I had, you see a lot of equations and variables and tabulated values, and it's very easy to get lost in why it matters and um, what the intuition is behind it. But if we can just take a step back and look at what delta H vaporization of component I is, I would like to point out how as T approaches the critical 
temperature of component I, um, we see how the enthalpy of vaporization of component I goes to zero. And this should make intuitive sense because what we know about water, for instance, is if you're at one atmosphere and you heat up some water to 100 degrees Celsius, it's going to start boiling spontaneously. Um, and so what I hope we see from this is that if we uh, look at um, the one of the fundamental laws in thermodynamics, we know that the Gibbs, uh, we can calculate uh, Gibbs by determining delta H minus T delta S. This term is always positive. Sorry. And so what that tells us is at the point at which um, your enthalpy of vaporization uh, switches from being a positive quantity to being a negative quantity, delta G will become less than zero. In other words, it becomes a spontaneous process. And so there's a very nice way of looping this all back to your physical intuition and realizing how um, as we're heating up a mixture, it's going to begin to spontaneously boil, which is what your intuition tells you. And so uh, if you are lost and you want to begin to look more into the intuition behind this stuff, just plug in T equals TCI into this equation here, and you're going to find that. And so it's a very nice sanity check for us. And uh, it will allow us to determine the enthalpy of our mixture. And then once we know the enthalpy of our mixture, the nice thing is uh, we can then do an enthalpy balance. And so to write that out with Delta H L of your total mixture, we can do an enthalpy balance to um, fully define our system. And so uh, what I'm trying to get at with that is um, with, once we know the delta H of the liquid, um, we would have an idea of what kind of impact uh, Q would have. So any heat that we're putting into our endothermic reactor, we're going to have a very good understanding of how it's going to impact the effluent temperature. And so um, I hope you guys find this useful. Let me know if you have any questions and thanks for watching.